Come on in. Welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about the 10 most iconic alliances in Survivor history. Once considered an unethical and dirty way of playing this game, ever since season one, alliances have been a crucial part of success in Survivor. You'll recall that the group of people who formed an alliance in Survivor Borneo made the final four together and became pop culture superstars. And the group that refused to align on principle made up the not final four. Ever since, alliances have been an integral part of Survivor, with dozens if not hundreds of alliances, both incredibly iconic and incredibly uniconic, existing throughout Survivor history. But 10 stand out to me as the most iconic ever in the history of the show. Legendary alliances which loom large in the Survivor mythos. The kind of alliance you want to be in if you're ever on the show. I'm defining alliances as a social and strategic partnership between any number of players, from groups of two all the way up to entire tribes, that lasted any number of days, although these alliances will tend towards the longer, obviously. All that said, let's take a look at the 10 most iconic alliances in Survivor history. At number 10 is the entire Karor tribe in Survivor Palau. The other nine spots were locked up pretty well, but there was a lot of competition for this number 10 spot. Then I remembered that Karor has Karen. Karen puts Karor over the top. Get off me! This is the most successful tribe in Survivor history. Karor never lost an immunity challenge pre-merge thanks to Tom's great leadership and Oolong's horrible everything, meaning that Karor never really had to turn on itself early on. And because they were so successful, the entire tribe was basically one huge alliance. The only vote they attended in the first half of the game was a mandatory vote for both tribes, and they just unanimously voted out the tribal immunity idol. At the merge, which was just the eight members of Karor and Stephanie, Karor finally has to vote one of their members off, with easy votes of Stephanie and the tribe stragglers. What I love about Karor is that they're just such a likable group of people. Outside of the appropriately named Karen, they're not terribly dramatic. Outside of Katie, they're not terribly funny. Outside of Tom and Ian, they're not terribly charismatic. On paper, this tribe should be as boring as Lamina, but something about this tribe just pops off the screen in a way other tribes full of relatively subdued personalities simply doesn't. Karor isn't one of the most entertaining alliances in history, but they are one of the most likable, and that's what gives them the edge in squeezing their way onto this list. Likable and entertaining. Uh, Lamina, are you taking notes? At number 9 are Wendell and Dom in Survivor Ghost Island. It's rare that an alliance from a pretty agreed upon bad season becomes incredibly iconic, so the popularity of the Wendell and Dom pairing can be directly attributed to the sincerity of the friendship between these two. They linked together very early on at Navidi and stuck together until the final four, the last chance either of them could take a shot at the other. They really only suffered one setback the entire game when they lost their third wheel Morgan at the first swap. That served as a serious wake up call for these two, as well as solidifying their brotherly bond for the rest of the game. From here on out, they exhibited an absurd amount of control over this cast. I mean, I know this cast is really passive, but they somehow linked up with the most passive players in the entire game and consistently convinced them to squash every coup attempt that came their way. The amount of times they convinced Laurel, Donathan, Sebastian, and Angela to vote against their own best interests is silly. But it's not their strategic power that makes them so iconic. You just can't fake the kind of friendship these two had. And watching Wendell and Dom just hang out together was one of the best parts of the entire season. They had more chemistry on the island than actual real-life couple Sebastian and Jenna. While shots on each other were considered as the game was winding down, Wendell and Dom stuck it out to Final Four, where Dom won the final immunity challenge and put Wendell into Final Four fire making, which he won, meaning that, fittingly, the pair that ran the season top to bottom would face the jury together. And in the only way this season could end, they tied Final Tribal 5 to 5, forcing Jeff to demote Laurel to juror, where she cast the winning ballot for Wendell. You know, Laurel, if you voted for Wendell like four days ago, you could have won this game. At number eight are the Foa Foa Four in Survivor Samoa. The Foa Foa Four are iconic because they are one of Survivor's greatest underdog alliances, 
and overcame a larger numbers deficit at the merge than any other minority alliance in Survivor history. With Natalie's incredible social game, Russell's strategic mastery and well-played idols, and Mick and Jason's being there too, they managed to turn an 8-4 deficit into a top 5 placement. Not bad. The Foa Foa 4 were not an alliance that began at the start of the game, however. The Foa Foa tribe was floundering early for two reasons. One, Russell was intentionally sabotaging the tribe. And two, their feckless leader Mick, who was chosen to lead the tribe on day one and led them into the ground. Foa Foa lost every single pre-merge immunity challenge except for one, and the Foa Foa tribe was whittled down from 10 to 4 as they looked for the secret sauce of what makes a successful tribe. Here's a hint, it doesn't include Ben. At the merge, the remaining Foa Foas stuck together out of necessity, and the one-two punch of Natalie convincing Galoo to flip on Eric, and then Russell's idling out of Kelly fractured Galoo beyond repair, allowing Foa Foa to wipe them one by one. It's an iconic Cinderella story that only suffers from Russell's oversized edit, which gave an undue portion of the credit for their success to him. Still, Foa Foa went as far as they could together, and Natalie, Russell, and Mick went to final tribal council. The Foa Foa 4 are iconic not only for their incredible come from behind win, but also because they're just plain fun to watch, despite Mick's best efforts. They're just lovable underdogs. Although, in all fairness, you're not actually going to root for Galoo, are you? Not even Galoo likes Galoo. At number 7 are the Kasaya 6 in Survivor Exile Island. Post-swap Kasaya is a hot mess that should have fallen apart at the first sign of pushback. They were not cohesive. They did not get along. They had nothing in common. Everyone in this alliance hated everyone else. At one point, Shane threatens to kill Courtney and... I believe him, but it works. This alliance formed post-swap when all of the huge personalities were sent to Kasaya and all of the soft-spoken, sleepy players were sent to Lamina. There's Shane, an already volatile man whose isolation and nicotine withdrawals sent him spiraling. There's Fire Dancing Courtney, whose introduction this season is her crying and drawing a heart around a dead turtle. And that's probably the least obnoxious thing she does this season. There's Bruce, who just wants to be left alone and do yoga in his rock garden. Good luck. There's Danielle, which is just what this tribe needs. Another quick-tempered and unfiltered East Coast personality. And finally, there's Aris and Sari, the normal people who had no choice but to keep them all together. Normal, of course, being relative. It's telling that the pre-merge vote where the Kasaya tribe was forced to vote one of their own off resulted in a 3-2-1-1 vote in which Bobby was sent home by plurality. Considering all that, it would have been reasonable to assume that the Kasaya 6 would blow their 6-4 lead at the merge, but somehow the Kasaya stuck together for three votes in a row and wiped out all of Lamina except for Terry, who was immune the entire post-merge thanks to an idol and an immunity streak. The fact is, every moment spent with Kasaya is more absurd and entertaining than the last. They can't even do medevacs normally. Dude, where on earth are your pants? It's impressive that a tribe with so little cohesion had so much cohesion. At number 6 are the Jalapau 3 and Survivor Token Chains. This is the ultimate bang for your buck underdog alliance. Most underdog alliances we like just because we're hardwired to root for an underdog. No one is actually rooting for Gary in Survivor Guatemala or Michael in Survivor Ghost Island. We're rooting for the idea of an underdog overcoming a difficult obstacle. But the Jalapau 3 would have been just as rootable and lovable if they were the overdogs the entire season and controlled every vote with an iron fist. You know how I know? Because by the end of Token Chains, they were controlling every vote with an iron fist. These three were aligned pre-merge and came into the merge down 6-4 against Timbira. As if they weren't already down enough, Joe was medevac at final 10, leaving them with an even bigger numerical deficit to overcome. This is a major case of addition by subtraction, however. Not only is it more impressive to overcome a 6-3 deficit, but also... Eh, Joe. Impressively, no one from Jalapau is even really brought up as a boot target at Final 10 or Final 9, despite the fact it obviously would be wise for Timbira to stick together at least a round or two. The Jalapau 3 successfully exploit the Grand Canyon-sized schism between Coach and Brendan, and make destroying a majority alliance look easy. 
At the start of the merge, JT and Steven are deferring to Coach. By the end of the game, Coach is deferring to JT and Steven. But the strategic side is only half the story. At the heart of Jollipow are the likable personalities. Family woman Taj, fish back out of water Steven, and good old boy JT. You can't watch this season and not love these three. They were true to each other to the final four, and JT and Steven went to the final two together. There really was something magic in the air at the Jollipow camp, and subsequent appearances from JT and Steven would show that this alliance really, really, really needed each other. Really needed. A lot. A very large amount. At number 5 is Cops R Us in Survivor Kageyan and Survivor Winners at War. Cops R Us began on the Brawn tribe in Survivor Kageyan when Sarah used her finely tuned cop dart to sniff out that Tony was also a cop. What, uh, what gave it away? Nothing about his appearance or demeanor says cop to me. Tony initially lied about his profession, but a few days later copped to his copiness to Sarah privately as a way to build trust between them, and thus, Cops R Us was born. Tony and Sarah were super tight in the early days of Kageyan, and you can tell that they actually really like each other on a personal level. This isn't just a survivor business relationship. You know how I know that? This is the one interpersonal relationship Tony actually built and managed himself rather than delegating Trish to do it. When they were separated at the swap, both found themselves in new and competing alliances, which made things complicated at the merge. Tony wanted Sarah to leave her alliance and join his, but she spent the entire merge round waffling on what to do, which annoyed Tony's alliance so much that they just voted her out instead. That might have been the end of Cops R Us as we know it, if not for Survivor, winners at war. From moment one this season, Tony and Sarah were ride or dies in a way this game rarely sees. By this point, they're close friends outside of the game, and they work together to sneak into the other tribe's camp, build a ladder, oh, and like, dominate the game strategically front to back. Cops R Us comes to a teary end at Final Four fire making, the stakes of which are incredibly high. Whoever wins this challenge will win the game. When Tony defeats Sarah, it's an incredibly emotional ending that really does display the real outside of the game feelings that exist in returning player seasons. But I mean, he'll be wiping his tears with $100 bills in about 24 hours, so he'll be fine. It's an iconic alliance of two of the greatest Survivor players of all time, who mostly stayed true to each other throughout some of the most chaotic seasons ever. And you know, if they'd known this alliance would become so iconic, they probably would have considered a different name. At number 4 are the I-24 and Survivor Cook Islands. The I-24 are the underdogs of the underdogs of the underdogs, but they weren't always underdogging it. Originally, things were going pretty well for the post-swap I-2 tribe. Yule had the idol, not that anyone knew that. And Yule, Becky, Penner, and Candace were in firm control of the tribe. They had Ozzy to carry them in challenges, and in camp, even Cowboy was contributing by making fire and foraging for food. Oh god, no, Cowboy, we're not eating that. That all came crashing down when Jeff offered the players the chance to swap tribes, and Candace and Penner unexpectedly mutinied. Both do it because they really want Adam's idol. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. I2 is completely screwed if they lose immunity even once, and there are three elimination rounds and two immunity challenges to go. But, you know, Aussie, so they don't. At the merge, they're still down 5 to 4 versus Raro, which is one of the most unpleasant alliances ever. It's like they cast this tribe at the sketchiest frat house on campus. Thankfully, Yule has a plan to get themselves out of the hole. Show Jonathan the idol. In this season, the immunity idol was particularly overpowered, and Penner wanted to be close to the power. That's the reason he flipped it all to begin with. So he actually flips back to I2, somehow giving a tribe that was once at an 8-4 disadvantage after the mutiny the power in the game. And in an extremely satisfying turn of events, these four vote off Raro one by one and make the final four together in one of the most impressive displays of stick to I've ever seen. These four deserve to be the final four. They're so rootable and they're all so kind and genuine especially in comparison. And the crazy thing is, it almost didn't happen. They needed Yule to find the idol, 
They needed to win the two post-mutiny immunities. They needed the bottle twist. They needed Raro to not vote off Jonathan despite that being the objectively correct play. And they needed Jonathan to be willing to burn all his bridges and flip back to them. If just one thing changes at any point during this entire season, we likely don't get this result. Think about it. If Billy pledges his love to like Jenny instead of Candace, then Adam probably butterfly effects his way into a win. I'll take this reality. At number three is Romber in Survivor All-Stars. No list of iconic alliances would be complete without Survivor's most iconic romantic pairing in Survivor history. Okay, second most iconic. I fell in, I, I fell in love in this game, love at first sight. Her name is Candace. And uh, in between, <laughs> Candace from Roro Tribe. Yeah. Originally viewed as two of the more questionable choices for Survivor's first returnee season, Amber and Boston Rob dominated the game at start to finish in what would be a star-making turn for both of them. And following the genesis of their relationship is really interesting, and the show tells that story well. They started together on Shapera and quickly aligned. At first, it's just a strategic partnership for both of them. Purely a strategic partnership, mall strategy. I think things change from a showman's to a genuine romance at the swap. When a bizarro tribe swap somehow swaps literally everyone in the game except for Amber, splitting them apart for the first time in the game. By all rights, Amber should be voted out here, but Lex and Kathy buy into the belief that Rob and Amber will work with them together at the merge and, foolishly, spare her. Rob, of course, believes that Amber will be voted out. It's the only right move for the Mogo Mogos to make, and he writes a for Amber on his arm. You could feel 10 million women swoon at this very moment. Romber comes back together at the merge, vote off Kathy and Lex, and frog march themselves to the final two together, each round growing more and more romantically attached. It's rare that a real life romance is captured so sincerely on camera. It's often extremely adorable, the kind of genuine connection and organic chemistry The Bachelor can only dream of capturing. Ultimately, they make the final two together and with a wave of bitter jurors in their wake, for whom voting for either Amber or Rob is a bitter pill to swallow. But in the ultimate screw you to the anti-Rob contingent of the jury, Amber wears her I Heart Rob shirt to the live finale, and Rob proposes to her before the votes are read, meaning that whoever wins, they both kinda win. And that, kids, is how I met your mother. At number two are the Toggy Four in Survivor Borneo. Survivor's original alliance was also one of its most controversial. Back in 2000, a majority of the viewing audience thought alliances were cheating, and that Richard Hatch was ruining Survivor by getting players to vote together. Of course, without this alliance setting the template that Survivor is a game of social strategy, with its creator being crowned the winner of the inaugural season, Survivor likely wouldn't have the longevity it ended up having. This alliance began in earnest around day 10, when Richard recruited Kelly, Rudy, and Sue to vote together, unbeknownst to the rest of the tribe. This alliance carried them to the merge alongside Dr. Sean, where a merge vote that only could have happened on season one happened. Remember, this was a time when you didn't talk about who you were voting for. You were just supposed to privately vote your conscience. But the Toggy Four wanted to take down Pagong, so they cast their four votes on the one person no one could vote against. If this was actually a game where outdoor survival skills and being a decent human were the criteria for success, Gretchen. And because this is season one, four votes out of 10 were enough. From then on, they just piled their votes on whoever Sean was voting for, and he happened to be voting alphabetically, and Pagong's names just so happened to all be earlier in the alphabet. One by one, the heroic Pagongs fell, and soon the Toggy Four were the final four. It's a bit of a misnomer that this was the only alliance in Borneo. It was just the only successful one. Stacy tried to put together an all-woman's alliance in Borneo in episode 3, trying to recruit Kelly and Sue to vote off Rudy. But you have a fundamental misunderstanding of Sue Hawk if you think she would join an all-woman alliance with a lawyer from San Francisco to vote off a Navy SEAL. Indeed, what makes this alliance different is that it showed that alliances are built on social bonds and trust. At the time, this alliance was absolutely hated for its perceived unfairness, 
even if audiences did like Rudy and Sue. But time has proven that the Toggy 4 are and always will be icons of the series, not only setting the template that 20 plus years of survivor strategy were built upon, but also by being four incredibly engaging and complicated personalities. They're like the founding fathers of Survivor, but actually way cooler. I mean, could James Madison do this? The most iconic alliance in Survivor history is the Black Widow Brigade in Survivor Micronesia. What can I say? Parvati, Amanda, Sari, Natalie, and Alexis spun a web of blindsides so iconic and so brutal that they practically made all woman alliances impossible from here on out. The genesis of this alliance exists on the Favorites tribe, where Parvati and Amanda formed a couples alliance with James and Ozzy, and picked up Sari as a fifth wheel, and possibly also as a babysitter to the little Ozlets, which will be running around this island any day now. After a tribe swap separated Parvati from Amanda and Sari, she formed crucial bonds with Natalie and Alexis on the new Irai tribe the rest is history. At the merge, the women decide to work together. Ozzy and James assume that their original couples alliance is going to the final four, but Parvati and Sari realize at final nine that they've got one shot to blindside an unassuming Ozzy on razor thin margins. Final nine of Micronesia was probably the last time he'd be without immunity and without a clue that he could get votes. Although Amanda is left out of the vote here, this is where the Black Widow Brigade is truly born in what I will always contend is Survivor's greatest blindside ever. There was no coming back from this for the women. Well, I wanted to talk to you because I like you. I didn't want it to be like completely awkward. Oh, it's gonna be awkward. From then on, it's a series of iconic eliminations. The men had no idea what they were up against, and the Black Widow Brigade had a ton of fun leaning hard into the femme fatale angle. The spider footage budget for this season must have been off the charts, and confessionals about ensnaring the men in their webs, picking their bones clean, and flossing with jugulars abound. It's just good to see women supporting women, you know? Of course, we can't talk about the Black Widow Brigade without talking about poor Eric. Eric ends up as the last man standing, and at final five, he wins immunity, seriously throwing a wrench in the Black Widow's plans. And at first, their plan to convince Eric to give up his immunity necklace to Natalie to redeem himself in the eyes of the jury for all his flip-flopping sounds stupid. So stupid, it just might work. At Tribal, they all lay it on thick, and Eric somehow gives immunity to Natalie, only for him to go home right after. Rope's little nugget of post-snuffing wisdom says everything you need to know about the Black Widow Brigade. I think that is what you call a life lesson. <laughs> Indeed. Got nothing else for you. If you want to join my iconic alliance of loyal viewers, like and subscribe and I'll get you more Survivor content just like this. Until next time, don't get idled out.